what follows is not told for the sake of bragging or in order to arouse the curiosity of some readers. I aim only to pinpoint a problem that I think is quite important and which is a matter of fact, and to warn those who wish to venture into the domain of magic to carefully consider the real dangers and serious responsibilities that are associated with it. Although this latter point has already been sufficiently emphasized, it will not be a bad idea to reiterate it, especially in a book such as this in which the contributors do not hesitate to disclose to the wider public with a minimum of veiling what has traditionally been reserved for a small elite. As far as my case is concerned, I do not think it necessary to recall the circumstances of life that have led to my experiences. The readers in search of orientation and guidance may find in it very little of relevance because of the very individual and scantly methodical character of my experiences. The concordance of peculiar states of mind I began to practice during wartime and in the high mountains, and the recourse to what one of us here has called corrosive waters, that is to say, to means that in the overwhelming majority of cases lead only to deviation or degradation. I will add that even today I do not know why I began to pursue these practices. I knew almost nothing about initiatic sciences. Moreover, the means I employed caused my organism to rebel and to be repulsed. It was sheer will that carried me through. I opened a path for myself thanks to my unaided will, with temerity joined to a certain force of desperation. I began from a state of total disgust. Nothing in life interested me any longer. I experienced the melancholy and the inner turmoil typical of adolescence. I resolved to let myself die slowly. If at first I desired anything at all, it was a yearning for dissolution. Let me set this aside. I know that many people have gone through analogous states of mind. Thus, I prepared to face death. The psychically saturated milieu of wartime and of mountain heights propitiated a sense of adventure and possibly even gave it a direction that it would not have had otherwise. Let us move on. Knowing what I know today, I can say that the meaning of the path I've followed since that time is the same as the one we have expounded so far in this book. Eroding the connection of my conscience with my body, I found myself outside the waters. I held firm against supersensible forces. Then I reaffirmed myself and began to act. Let me describe some stages of my experience that bear on the present problem. In the case of a man who is freeing himself, something lies in ambush at every step of the way, ready to strike him. First on the mental plane. During the early phases of detachment, what occurs is a halt in the process of cerebration. The mind is immobilized as if stunned. What ensues is a special state that I would like to call a state of clarity or of evidence. This state no longer knows any arguments, concepts, or doubts. In this state there are no longer problems, but rather a deep-seated real need for knowledge, which is followed by the flash of direct evidence, namely an idea with the character of revelation, of peremptory, absolute, and resounding certainty. During these illuminations, my soul remained entirely passive. Eventually, I succeeded in moving it. Then something like a collapse ensued. I experienced the illusion of the previous evidences. I realized that everything could take on such a character of evidence, even opposite truths, as long as the soul, while in that state, wanted it so. It was a frightful moment but I crossed over the abyss of folly. The relativity of truth is a philosophical commonplace. As a student of philosophy, I was not in the least impressed by it. 
there is no possible comparison between this truth, which is a simple intellectual notion, and that experience. The experience generates the feeling of an absolute lack of firm ground, a feeling of falling and an icy, deadly sense of isolation. I felt myself to be on the verge of falling apart and dissolving in the blind chaos of incoherence. What saved me was a sort of sacrilegious violence, the daring of an absolute affirmation that reopened the circle. I found again a support, but this support in my case was action itself rather than truth. Later on, during more advanced phases of my detachment process, the danger came back, though under another form. It was like a sexual orgasm, paroxysmic, growing to a boiling point. At that moment, I knew that a discharge had to occur. An epileptic crisis or something like that, maybe even more terrifying, was about to happen. I went over the razor's edge again. The power that I had awoken took another direction. Slowly, something resembling a transfiguration occurred, namely an ecstasy, a joyful expansion of consciousness. I cannot compare that sense of liberation of breath with anything else. When I compare it to my previous and habitual consciousness, only one image comes to mind. The most lucid, conscious state of wakefulness in comparison to the deepest, most hypnotic and torpid state of sleep. What I felt before now appeared to me as a most absurd, silly, and unlikely thing. Naturally, after I experienced this state when undergoing similar experiences, I knew the way to overcome the impasse at such critical junctures. Nevertheless, I must add that from a psychological point of view, the unfolding of the phenomenon resembles that bouncing of the effects which I will mention later. I came to experience presences, and that which has no physical body, not under the guise of astral images, but rather in the form of intensity as the feeling of force fields, to use the expressive term of the scientists. My constant recourse to the will led me to relationships of identification and to sinking feelings that paralyzed my physical sight. I learned that thunder thunderbolts and storms are not limited to the physical world. I became prudent. I learned to give up a lot of things in order to be able to retain the ground that I was fiercely holding on to. At this point, what ensued were events that I wished to consider in a particular way. It is clear to me that in the world of beings there is a law of necessity comparable to the physical law of action and reaction. When resistance is created against the vortex of a being, the cause of an effect is produced, all the more so in the case of a magical operation. The effect is a reaction, namely a power of the being that turns against whoever acts or offers resistance. If the practitioner knows how to resist, the force is discharged elsewhere, but in any event, it is discharged. The lines of lesser resistance then consist of those people who are connected through a bond of sympathy, or even of blood, with him who acts. I know this from personal experience. This knowledge opened my eyes to a world of new meanings. I learned that it is possible to strike deals and to pay in another coin. For example, to pay with the values of physical and material life for the degree and the power that have been achieved in the supersensible dimension. How clearly I understood the reason for the affliction and sufferings, at first sight unexplainable, of saints and initiates. Likewise, the doctrine of the so-called vicarious expiation became very obvious to me. It is possible to remove in a supernatural way other people's sins and evil on the condition of taking them upon oneself or vice versa. I, however, did not accept any deal and made no concessions, not out of fear or out of selfishness, but 
due to a deep yearning for the unconditioned that never abandoned me. I succeeded almost completely in parrying the blows aimed in rapid succession at my mind, at my physical organism, and eventually at my practice. What happened was that the reactions sought another release and were discharged onto other people. I knew this with certainty through visions of things that eventually happened, even in other cities. This vision flashed after magical operations and was accompanied by a sense of solution, analogous to the solution of the paroxysmic crises I have previously mentioned, and analogous to the harmonic conclusion of a musical piece. I have already mentioned what the natural lines of lesser resistance are, I must also add that they are paralyzed as soon as one succeeds in overcoming any type of attachment and shutting out any resonance of affection. I am certain that this happens not out of vengeance or retaliation, but due to a natural and impersonal law of the subtle world. Every affective bond is like a psychic communication tube between two people. As the first and more immediate solution, the parried reactions go through it on to another person. But the discipline of purification on which magical studies focus and the achievement of impassibility, of neutrality and detachment destroys this communication. Is there then a law that leads the reactions on to other predestined beings, whom we may not know? I do not know, but I believe so. I will not deny that I was deeply shaken by these facts, the most significant of which are recent. Let me be clear about this. I am capable of silencing in and around myself any moral scruples, superstitions of good and evil, seizures of piety and compassion. But if the problem presented itself differently, in other words, if what I have briefly mentioned should take place due to a personal and inner weakness that I am not yet aware of, or if it should happen because I am not yet able to demand from myself a further strength, in that case, out of a sense of inner dignity, I would feel a responsibility to be assumed fully and without excuses. It is possible to affirm oneself in the supersensible world. It is possible from there to act in every direction, whether evil or good. It is possible through a sufficient strength and renunciation to subtract oneself from effects and to remain standing above every law while enduring blows that are not of a physical kind. But is it also possible to void and to suspend these effects? In other words, is it possible to break the law of action and reaction of beings? As of today, I still do not know. I would regard it a great fortune to meet someone capable and willing to give me an answer. In this regard, I was greatly impressed by what I read in Myrink's Gollum. You ask me, how has it come to pass that I, despite the detachment I have achieved from the web of life, could be transformed overnight into a sexual murderer? I will tell you. Human beings are like glass tubes through which many colored balls may roll. Most men are restricted to one color only. Should the ball be red, the man is branded as bad. If yellow, then he is good. Should two balls pursue their passage to the same two, one yellow and one red, then the man has an unstable character. But we who have been bitten by the serpent of the kingdom of the spirit compress into one life the experiences of a whole race within an age. Colored balls rush wildly one after another on their way through the glass tube. And when it ends, then we are prophets and the very mirror of God himself. Then he added, When I had committed my crime, I had no choice in the matter. Had I resisted, I would have created a new cause. When I committed the murder, I did not create any cause. That was but the working out of some dormant principle, long hidden within my being over which I possessed no power. 
Now that the Holy of Holies within me has turned me into a murderer, now that it has led to my execution, men hang me on the gallows, and thereby is my destiny let loose from theirs. Henceforth I am free. My rank adds that this is the path of death of those who have accepted the red grains, the symbol of magical powers. He also mentioned the possibility of not accepting them and finally of a third possibility, namely to send them back to the flow of generations as latent powers until they will blossom. Nonetheless, this does not really shed any new light. The problem remains for those who do not accept this path of death, nor the path of mystics, but who instead yearn to attain a pure power according to the promises of magic. In this case, we would need to know if the law of reaction is an unavoidable fatality, so much so that the sacrifice of other people is brought about by the becoming free, ascending, and integrating of those on the magical path. In other words, if this law could be removed. This is the problem I wanted to propose. It seems to me that it is one of the greatest problems in the matter we are pursuing. It would be highly desirable if it were addressed by some qualified person who could illuminate it on the basis of the vaster horizons of his spiritual attainments.